So I have people that have studied Meisner. You know, you'll hear people go, yeah, I tried Meisner, it didn't, it didn't work for me. And I'm always like, oh my God, it is all about authenticity. It's all about falling into the most free, liberated version of you. The genesis of the technique. I think you are one of the purists of the Meissner technique. They claim to study with Sandy after he stopped teaching. I know this is gonna piss off some people. There are gonna be some people coming, you know, I'm sure of that. I tried to be as honest and diplomatic as possible, as respectful as possible. Sure, I, I'm here in San Francisco. Uh, as beautiful as your city is, I feel like uh, that's how blessed I am. I feel like we're just in the, one of the most beautiful cities on the planet and our, it's called the Meisner Technique Studio and it's located in the heart of, of, of San Francisco. Um, and this studio is, uh, it, you know, it's on our website and it's something I've been saying ever since I've been teaching, which is now over 30 years, which is pure, legitimate, authentic. Um, it's not some egocentric uh, words I throw around or words I throw around casually or irresponsibly. That's the last conversation I had with Sandy shortly before he passed. I promised him that once I established my career first and foremost as an actor, I would then establish a school in his name and I would present his teachings as pure and legitimate and as authentic as possible. So that's what I'm dedicated to. This is not a, and there's, you know, it's all over, people are teaching Meisner all over the world, and it's a wonderful thing for so many reasons. But like anything, it starts to get diluted. Uh, I recently interviewed somebody, they, 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 they got introduced to Meisner at a yoga class, you know. <laughs> so, you know, Sandy's genius is out there, and a lot of well-intentioned people are teaching it, who study with somebody, who study with somebody, and it just starts to get shifted, changed, etc. Um, my teacher was Sanford Meisner. Through the grace of God, my teacher was Sandy. And not only as a student, but a uh, mentor to carry on his teaching legacy. That I'm his last teaching protege does not make me anointed or special. I just was in the right place at the right time. And that was 34 years ago. So I mentored not only as a student, uh, but then uh, as someone to teach this information. And so uh, that's what this school is dedicated to. to this, we take our students on the exact same journey, brick by brick, step by step, class by class, session by session, uh, throughout the, to, from beginning to end of the full training. Yes, so the full training meaning you're doing the traditional two years, right? Someone comes into your school. That is correct, that is correct. It's misleading, it's really not two years. That you hear that all the time, but that does include the breaks. And the breaks were an important part of the training. Sandy stressed how, uh, first of all, everyone's just working really hard. This is world-class training. This is a, a huge demand of time, energy, um, class twice a week, plus all the practice time outside of, of, of class. So it's a lot. And that's why the breaks are important. It's really supposed to be taught in a total, at least how Sandy did it, in a total, that's how it's supposed to be taught, in a total of six three-month sessions. Um, and, uh, but the breaks, as I say, we have summer breaks, we have a holiday break, uh, in December, uh, just as Sandy did, and we get right back at it and come September, and it just cycles again. Okay, thank you very much. So if someone wants to get uh, into your class and your training, uh, do you have any requirements in terms of previous training, and especially uh, uh, are you going to ask them to rehearse outside the class? Because I know that some Meissner teachers have different opinions on that. Should, should uh, students rehearse like the repetition exercise, for example, outside of the class, or should that be just when the teacher is around. Oh gosh, you mean, you've heard where people don't want them practicing the repetition outside of class? Yes. Oh my gosh, no, my God, no. Sandy would, he'd, he'd go crazy at that. Of course you're supposed to be practicing constantly, constantly. You know, um, you know I, I, okay, here, I'll answer. Let's see, where, where do we start with that one? Um, uh, the requirements, you know, I, I just like Sandy, but there's no audition for accept, acceptance. You know, let's be very clear. The, you know, when I came to Sandy, it was near the end of his life, right? He was uh, 84 years of age and when I first started studying with him. And so I wasn't a student at the neighborhood playhouse. I wasn't an 18-year-old kid going to the neighborhood playhouse who, who you really didn't get Sandy till your second year. And it was a performing arts school. You had music and dance and movement and, 
and, and Meis, the introduction to Meisner. And at some point, if you, if you earned it and you were lucky enough, you got Sandy at some point in the training. That wasn't me and that wasn't my experience. I was in Sanford Meisner's professional private class. This was, your teacher was Sandy from that first class to the very last class. There was no other curriculum. It wasn't a, a, a conservatory. It was Sandy's class twice a week plus the practice time. The practice times are the key. Sandy wanted us practicing outside of class a minimum of three times a week. Hell, I practiced every day, honestly. No exaggeration. If anything, I worked too hard. I should have relaxed more, but I started later in life. I was 29 when I began my dream and, and this career and my, and my journey with Sandy, which is all one and the same. And I practiced every single day. Um, so back, back to it, as far as the curriculum or the requirements to get into my school, um, you know, I don't audition for acceptance. I don't care about previous training or experience. Um, quite often in a beginning class, we'll have people who have never acted in their lives, sitting right next to somebody with extensive training and experience. It doesn't matter. You're all gonna start at the very beginning of this brick by brick process. In fact, some of the people I've discovered over the years that have had a lot of training, they can be a little difficult for a while. It doesn't mean that what they've learned doesn't have value or, or you're invalidating their previous teachings and teachers, not at all. Sandy used to say, whatever works, excuse me, whatever works, use it. But when you're, if you're gonna go on this journey, leave all that outside the classroom for now. Let us put this foundation in place. When we're done, you decide what works for you. And if you wanna pull a little bit of that and it violates what I taught you, Sandy said, use it, whatever works. You're not all the same. There's no one way or right way to get to this instrument, to this piano. So it was one of the great, great, one of the many great things about Sandy was his, his lack of, of dictatorship, if you will, his myopic approach that this is the only way to work. He did not believe that at all. He, was, he felt strongly his way had value, but he also saw that it wasn't for everybody. Um, so, and I have a very soft spot in my heart for people that have never had any training. You have to, when I started with Sanford Meisner, he had a three year wait list. I wrote him a letter communicating, pouring my heart out as to, you know, basically said, I'm, I believe I figured out what I've been put on this earth to do. I'm starting late in life uh, and I need great. And I believe me, it was an eight page uh, handwritten vomit of how I'd crawl through glass trying to figure out what I was put on this earth to do. And I, I felt that it was to have a voice and tell stories and, and have this, this, this platform, this pulpit, this, this opportunity called theater and film. And it resonated enough with Sandy that he, uh, he had somebody reach out and schedule a meeting. And three weeks after first beginning my career, I'm sitting in front of Sanford Meisner, 29 years of age, no training, no experience, never acted in my entire life in anything. Um, and I, so, so A, I have a soft spot in my heart, my heart for people that, that are willing to go on this journey and have, ha, have none of this. But also, I, it turned out to be one of my great strengths because I was just wide open. I was a blank canvas. I didn't have a lot of bad habits from, you know, in, in, the, in, a, in the U.S., there's a lot of community theater, and it's a wonderful thing. It lets a lot of people have some fun and, 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 and play and, and, and experience all this. But man, oh man, people that have grown up in community theater can often pick up a lot of bad habits. The colleges are well known for this too. There's, of course, there's wonderful programs, but you can also pick up a lot of acting habits, a lot of big and theatrical and, you know, and, and they're, because you don't have much craft, they're being over-directed. They're basically marionette puppets. Do this, say it this way, a lot of line readings, you know, fake crying. All this stuff is just very theatrical and put on because they got to put up a show in three weeks. As you know, this approach is the opposite of that. You, you've got to earn the right to speak those words. And we don't play characters, we earn them. And that takes time. And so because I was a blank canvas, I didn't have a lot of prejudices or things that, that, I had to, that, that Sandy had to cut through to get to my foundation. One of my favorite, I would do really good work in class from time to time. But when I would, Sandy would, I, he'd, go, he'd, go, he'd go, who else have you studied with besides me? And I say, no one, Sandy, and he'd go, and he's turn around and smile and go, that's right. And that was obviously a little bit of him puffing out his chest a little bit, but it also spoke to um, how pure, when you don't have a lot of uh, things to work through, 
that the foundation can really be put in place quite cleanly. As far as practice outside of class, I don't know, who, who, whoever's teaching you that you shouldn't be practicing the repetition outside because what well, I guess the logic would be you might be doing it wrong, that should be corrected in class. And if they're doing it wrong, give them teachings about why they're doing it wrong. And then go practice, go grow into what you just, what we just taught you. Go, your whole job, <laughs> Sandy once said this one, this is a great teaching. He once said, some of you are under the uh, misconception you're here to work, meaning in class. He goes, that's a falsehood. You're here to show me the fruits of your work, meaning what have you been practicing since I last saw you? What, have you, what are your questions? What have you gotten better at? What have you struggled? So you're at, he, he, the practices in between the classes are critical. Will we miss step a little bit? When I was first learning the repetition, was I any good at it? Gosh, no. Were the people that I was working off very good? The people, I, yeah, I felt like I was on my heels the whole time. So it's sloppy, it's bumpy, but that's part of what technique is, is not needing Sandy, not needing your teacher. Technique, he once said, is knowing how to fix it when it's not working and not needing me. I mean, there it is. So, you know, you should be flying that plane. Sandy wanted you practicing. I'll just leave it at that. Yeah, thank you very much. And that's what I heard as well. I heard uh, both sides of the story, but some teachers teach it in a way, uh, either for marketing reasons or because of the specificity of the approach. They say this cannot be practiced safely or usefully outside of class. And I, I also think, and I also heard that it's a, it's a wrong idea and that uh, exactly you need to, uh, that class is more of a supervision of what uh, you've done in terms of being autonomous as well uh, in the technique, like independent as well, because in the end, you're going to have to, uh, you know, own the technique for your professional life. So obviously uh, you need to not rely on the class too much if you want to do that successfully. Yes, yes, yes. Yep. Thank you very much. I, so I must ask you later on about uh, some of the exercises and the rules because even for the repetition, which is the first basic exercise, some people teach the Meissner technique as if it was only the repetition, almost like if it was a warm up to be spontaneous and they don't really go into particularizations or any kind of more advanced work. We'll go deeper in this, but what I was going to answer was, so I have people that have studied Meissner. You know, you'll hear people go, yeah, I tried Meissner. It didn't, it didn't work for me. And I'm always like, oh my God, people think the Meisner technique is the repetition exercise. Nothing infuriated Sandy more. And those of you that really know the technique for real, you know that it was this is the repetition at the beginning, the foundation of which it all rests, which is what? To get out of our head and work from our gut and not act and be present and be wide open to what exists and not what we want to create. Do what you're made to do, not what you want to do, Sandy would say over and over. Hell yes, that's the foundation. But the Meisner technique is so much more than the repetition exercise. So you'll hear people say, yeah, I tried Meisner, I did Meisner, I didn't like it. or did." And again, I always like, well, who'd you learn it from and, and where does their qualifications to even teach this information? But anyway, it just is what it is. But the bottom line is, is that the repetition itself is, is certainly supposed to be a means to an end. By the end of, hell, even into second year, you're, you know, the basic repetition has grown so much that now the goal is that you're working in that same spontaneous, organic, moment-to-moment, -moment, unmanipulated way with somebody else's words to be able to do, to take scripted material and be as present and, and, and dance that way. Back to my point, which is people who come to me with previous Meisner training, that what that typically means is they've done some repetition. And almost, I'm talking like 90, over 95% of the time, what they were taught in terms of just the basic repetition, just the foundation, is, is wobbly. It's not clean. It's close. It, there's, you know, some are a bit closer. And I'm talking, um, uh, I don't know how... <laughs> what kind of names we want to be bringing up. But there's some people out there who spent a long time with Sandy who had falling outs with Sandy over the fact that Sandy didn't feel that they, that they were teaching the technique in the purity uh, that he wanted it anymore. They'd made their own changes, which he says you're free to do. But don't call it the miser technique. You're not teaching that anymore. You're teaching your version of it, your interpretation of it, which is fine. You can absolutely do it. But that's not what I teach. And that's back to what we're dedicated to. You know, I'm not trying, I'm not here impersonating Sandy. I'm not trying to imitate him, but I'm, I got 
you know, 15, over 2,000 hours of class time and 15 notebooks filled and three teaching syllabuses of his teachings where that's what I constantly get to teach off of. It's not just pulling from the book and little piffy quotes. I'm able to actually say, here's where we are. Here's Sandy's words that day on this teaching. This is what, he, this is what it means. This is what he meant. And back to the, again, back to the repetition. It's, it's um, these teachers who, even well-known ones, you'll find that what, the, what Sandy wanted and what's happening is not clean. So we got to clean it up. Yes, exactly. And it's also, it's something that is in uh, William Esper's book as well. He talks about uh, the dilution of the technique as well and the fact that the early exercises are easy to teach or seem easy to teach. Therefore, many teachers you know, claim to be master teachers and they completely change the work. The worst part for me when I was studying with many different master teachers who were teaching sometimes completely different things, like completely different types of repetitions. Sometimes they adapt it out of a lack of knowledge of it, meaning like they don't know the full technique and then make choices to like expand over it, like Meissner did with Stanislavski's work, for example, uh, you know, trying to get to uh, the, the true Stanislavski, at least before uh, creating his own thing. And I feel like most people who like adapt it, like 90%, 99% of the time, they just don't know much about it. And then they just feel like there's potential in those exercises and they go in completely different directions. It's true of any great teacher, right? I mean, any great teacher is going to have these, these people. Look, Sandy once said, every time the rent's due, there's a thousand actors who run around and call themselves acting teachers. And he said, I can't tell you how many claim to have studied with me. And just because you did study with me doesn't mean you're qualified to teach. And boy, did I experience that. The difference between being a student in Sandy's class and going through the training and then being working side by side, side by side is overstated, but you know what I mean, being uh, uh, mentored by him now as a teacher to be able to ask completely different questions, much more intelligent questions, and, and really get detail and specifics about, about why this and why did you do this and how come these components, you know, getting clarity about the, the kind of questions you wouldn't even think of asking as a student. So the difference between being a student in Sandy's class and teaching the information is dramatic. Number two, and then to be mentored by him, you know, is, is the, it, 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 I don't know how else to say it, it's just so darn true, is that there are people out there, this, this last year when the pandemic hit, there's a teacher in LA teaching Meisner who's quite successful, and I do Meisner because, as you'll hear in a second, um, she reached out uh, to see if I would be willing to uh, help run her school down there, um, and she did not study with Sandy ever and, and uh, uh, study with somebody who was a teacher of Sandy's. And, um, and Sandy and this teacher did have a falling out. And so this woman uh, has built a very successful school in LA. And so when we started talking about, I wasn't going to do the job, but we just were starting to talk about uh, the technique, she said, how is the technique on, you know, what is, how do you teach it? What's the order? And I was sharing basics, and then I asked her, and where I'm going with this is, at one point, she was saying things that I've never even heard of. She was calling certain exercises, not only had I never heard of the exercise, uh, it, 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 it made no sense whatsoever. And I'm just telling, I, all I can tell you is that Sandy was my teacher. He taught me as a student and now to carry on. His and I had never even heard of these things. And so this, I just, when I hung up, I was like going, wow, wow, there it is. We're speaking different languages. Is there some commonality? Of course there is. Is this teacher, mean, does, does she mean well? Yes, she does. I can tell she's a good person who, who cares. But does she think she's teaching the Meisner technique? How, yes, she does. Is she? No, she's not. And I, I, I don't, anyway, so that, that, that's the best way to describe it is, is that it's like that telephone game. You know, you say something into somebody's ear and it just goes now 30 people later, it gets diluted. That can't be a, a surprise. So the closer you are to the source, you know, prior to the internet, this is so funny, you'll love this, you know, I've been, I've been teaching, for, this is my, I'm, it's what, 2021, so uh, at this point I'm on my 34th year um, of doing this, and I was teaching in Hawaii about 27 years ago. The internet had just begun, and about a year or two into the internet, I started getting emails from people around the world, 
from uh, you know, Europe, UK, Australia, hey, my teacher teaches the Meisner technique and he or she claims this, is this true? And they were saying, these people, this was before people, before you could find out about people, you could, you could find out more. These people were making claims that, and they were there basically at the exact same time I was, I've never heard of them, that they claimed to have studied with Sandy as a teacher at a time when I was, I was there that they claimed to study with Sandy after he stopped teaching. So I just said, basically, look, if somebody tells you they teach the Meisner technique, ask them the following questions. Did you study with Sandy? And if they say, you know, that doesn't mean they're not a good teacher. But if they're making claims that they study with Sandy, I know somebody traveling around this planet right now, marketing and promoting in a huge way that they studied with Sandy. You know what they did? Sandy came in and talked to their class one time. And that's, and, and that's how they can market it. Anyone can throw up a website and make claims, and there it is. And so ask the person, did you study with Sandy? Yes, I did. Oh, cool. How long? How long? And did you go through the formal training? You know, and did you go through the, the entire training? And, and find, out the, you know, find out the years, and, and, and these things are, you can verify these things. If, or don't. I'm just saying that early on it was a wild west out there as people didn't realize that people could find out about them and, and it didn't take long for people. And by the way, I'm thinking of two people in particular, things got cleaned up quick because I kept going, I'm telling you, I've never heard of this person. I was there during the exact time. By the way, Sandy stopped teaching by then, so that's not true. So as, as you, they'd shared these, autobi these biographies on their websites, etc., so, you know, again, it's, it's, it's not a surprise, this is what people do. Um, but anyway. It's interesting, you know, like to my knowledge, uh, Sandy uh, reluctance to document his work because he didn't want it to be set in stone or because, you know, he didn't want to compromise it or whatever, led to a lack of promotion of the technique compared maybe to the Strasberg method, for example, at, at one time at least. And also to the ability of people to claim uh, different things without really knowing the things which is why now with the internet and doing these sorts of interviews, I feel like it's important for people to kind of get some clarity because acting is one of the fields where uh, you can, and, and I've lived that myself as a student, I was trying to learn a technique, another technique, and unlike in music or dance or martial arts or whatever, when you, you learn judo, you know, like uh, with one teacher or another, you learn exactly the same martial arts. They don't mix in some uh, karate or, you know, uh, taekwondo, whatever. Uh, and with the Meissner technique, it's such a difference. It's like not even the same thing. So I feel like it's confusing for students, regardless of how healthy a competent the teacher might be. Uh, I think it's very important to, uh, to get clear of like the function of the exercises historically as well. Uh, and I don't want uh, to, you know, overly talk about uh, people or give names and we can, uh, of course, edit that afterwards uh, at your convenience. But how would you describe and why uh, would you say there is such a political game going on with different schools of Meissner? And I asked you last time about the Meissner estate and what is this worth, etc. Let's talk the politics. You know, why? Why is it so divisive that way? Why does everyone think that they've got the, the, the corner on the market, you know? And um, I think it's just more having to do with uh, lack, trying to build something and, and, you know, uh, I mean, you know, over the years I've had people take pot shots at, at me and my qualifications to teach, you know, and because when I studied with Sandy, he was no longer at the neighborhood playhouse. You couldn't conduct class. You couldn't mentor. There was, Sandy didn't have a space. He had moved to Los Angeles. We were his first class in LA. I began teaching for Sandy my first year. By, sec by third session, I was mentoring the next group behind us. He'd go call Jimmy Jarrett. So I, I, but I wasn't a teacher. I just was, I knew what I was doing at that point to a degree to help the babies with basic repetition. So I would meet with them. And then second year, I was doing that all the time. And, and so, you know, as it evolved, and now as I'm mentoring with Sandy, my apprenticeship, that's why I say my apprenticeship was more in private because I would sit in on classes but I also would spend so much time with him privately, one-on-one, -on -one, 
talking both as an actor and as a teacher in training. So it wasn't like back in the days at the neighborhood playhouse where you showed up every day and, and sat in on classes with Sandy as he bounced around. It, he didn't have a space like that. Um, and so it was a different apprenticeship, but it was from 1987 to 1991. Those are my windows when I was with Sanford Meisner. Two as a student, two more working privately as an assistant and a teacher in training. Okay, and so you know when you emerge with that, uh, those qualifications, and you, you are dedicated to the purity of this. Let's go back to what I said earlier. One of the last conversation I ever had with Sandy is I promised him. I wanted to establish my career first and foremost as an actor. I didn't even want to teach. And he told me, he goes, you'll have to. You'll have new, no choice. And I said, why? And he goes, because you care too much. You care so much about being an actor, what's possible, the purity of it, and that I knew was true, and about the information this way of working, and I knew that to be true. And he was right. You know, I used to kind of fight teaching. I loved doing it. I loved when I, I tour a lot. I have a bunch of shows that were, became very successful, and I toured. That's how I made my living. You know, I always consider myself one of the most successful actors you'll ever meet. You don't recognize me. I'm not rich and famous. I've made my career doing theater, traveling all over the world. You're not going to get rich and famous doing that, typically. But damn, what a life. What a, to make a living as an actor doing theater? For 30 years, it's almost impossible. And then I just taught along the way. I'd, you come to a community, you teach. And I had my school in Hawaii, and I had one in Sun Valley. But I hadn't established a permanent home because I was busy, too busy as an actor. And finally, about 15 years ago, I made this decision to, to sacrifice the acting to build this up. It, was felt, it felt right that it was time to establish this school in his name. So, so, you know, I am dedicated to the purity of this. And I, I guess as far as why all the politics, I just feel like it comes from lack. I know up here in the Bay Area, there's not as many acting teachers. There's this couple Meisner programs. There are. And when I say I don't feel like I have competition, that, I don't mean that in a demeaning way. I don't know anything about these other people. I don't care. It's not even in my world. I don't worry about them. I know exactly who I am in terms of Sandy and, and, that, and that relationship and that lineage, and I know what I'm dedicated to. And, and so I don't feel, when I say I don't feel like I have competition, I just simply mean I'm not competing against anybody. I'm just doing what, what I promised Sandy I'd do as best as I can. So I don't feel that. But then again, I'm up here in the Bay Area. Down in LA, man, there's an acting teacher on every corner. So, 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 so. I just think that there's just a lot of people who, um, want to have this authority and and they want to be especially if they're in a market where there are others fighting for respect position notoriety etc that they're they'll make claims or they'll just be so damn competitive and almost mean-spirited like there's not enough and um you know i think it's probably true of any business right probably but it is true in this profession for sure. Um, uh, and you're right, it, it's fine. You know, but, but check this out, this is very interesting. The most respected Meisner, legitimate Meisner teachers on the planet, I'm close with. I find that to be interesting. And we've been close forever. They know who I am, I know who they are. My God, I know who they are, they were ahead of me. And they've been so gracious to me. Um, for those same reasons, there's no competition, and and it, granted we're not in the same markets, but you know when we when I do shows there or I go in and teach or they come up, vice versa, it's so reciprocal. Reciprocal. There's no there's no ego. There's no nothing. There's there's this fraternity. It feels like a fraternity of people that earn their chair. Honestly, um, you know so. If that answers that one. Would you like to uh, give a few names uh, or uh, like about some people or some schools that you think are legitimate or like how would you describe them? Because as we talked about last time, there was a book that came out recently uh, that was co-written with uh, James Carville, uh, so like the Meissner Estate, which lists yeah. Yeah, a bunch okay. of teachers. Sure. And, and sure. I've heard that many, many uh, people... Um, uh, are not in that book and uh, think that this book is biased in some ways? 
Well, first of all, you know, I'm not flattering you. I think your school's legitimate. By that, I mean, yeah, I know you didn't study with Sandy, but I know you care. I followed you for a long time. I've watched you from a distance for a long time, and I know people who know you, and, and I just, you, you're walk, you walk with great in sincerity and integrity, and you're, you, wanted, you want to present this. You want this to be as legitimate as possible, as clean as possible. So that, to me, is anybody, and I'm going to leave out a bunch around the planet. I can only share with what I know. Um, in Los Angeles, for example, Bill Alderson, who was with Sandy for 25 years, the William Alderson studio. Bill's getting up in age. You know, he's, he's getting older now. And with COVID, and I don't even know if his school will survive it. But prior to COVID, Bill had been running the William Alderson studio in L.A. for 30-plus years. He was in John Voigt's class, and he spent 25 years assisting under Sandy in New York at the Playhouse. Um, the next one would be Bob Carnegie. Bob Carnegie of the Playhouse West. When Sandy first moved to Los Angeles, this is where Sandy t Bob opened up his studio. He ran it with Jeff Goldblum at the time, but Jeff was blowing up as an actor and was hardly around at that point. No criticism, he just was busy with his career. So Bob took over the reins and, and drove that school to what it's become. Um, and, you know, they, you know they, they, they take a different approach. Uh, 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 let's see, how do I say this? Because it's just what they've chosen to do as far as a business model. They don't have uh, the technique. You don't, you're not part of a class that goes on a two-year journey. You, you just show up and you join a class that's already going. And this is very common around the planet. It's a way to keep things moving. It's a way to attract a lot of students. Our students right now, all classes are full at my studio, even with COVID. You can't study with me again until September. We're now interviewing for September. So even if you wanted to start studying tomorrow, you can't just pop in and join. Most places, that's not the case, nor would they want that to be the case. I don't want to lose people. And I, you know, look, I'm very blessed. I make my living as an actor. I teach because I love it. I don't teach for a dollar bill. And that allows me to continue to the purity of this lineage and, and doing it the way Sandy wanted. That implies, as I'm saying that, that those people are teaching for a dollar bill. I don't mean that at all. They've just chosen over the years to, in a market that they're in, saturated with actors everywhere, to have a different policy. So they have more of a beginning, an intermediate, and an advanced class. And you can, you can miss class. Sandy, you can never miss class. You can't be late, you can't miss, miss class, ever! You know, and that's our policy here too. In a lot of these places that I just described, that I'm listing as legitimate, you could miss class. And you could miss for a month and then come back. And so it's different. It's, it's, it's a different approach, but I list them because I know them as who they are, and I know their qualifications to teach. Um, there's, uh, uh, yeah, okay, so I'll, I'll, I'll stop at that for now. You know, let's just give you a little history, okay? Sandy was married twice. His second wife broke his heart, devastated him. As she, I'll spare you what happened, but it just broke his heart. And he basically just said, screw it, I'm done with relationships. And he never was with, uh, uh, well, I, I don't I've known that to be true. I was going to say, he's never with a woman again intimately. I don't know. But he's never in a relationship with a woman. That I do know. And eventually, um, a guy named Jimmy Carville, James Carville, uh, who was a student of Sandy's in the 60s, uh, became, uh, they became friends and then uh, lovers, partners. And so that's where you hear that uh, that's who Sandy's partner was for uh, the next 30 plus years of, of, of Sandy's life, Jam Jimmy Carville. And um, I'm, I'm just going to say it. Here it comes. Here we go. Um, Jimmy was, uh, you know, you've seen certain relationships that are, when they're unhealthy, one of the partners can be very jealous and, and protective. And that was Jimmy. Jimmy was, you know, the teachers I mentioned earlier, Bob Carnegie, Bill Alderson, but I remember John Voigt, Sidney Pollock, all these people would say they don't even go around Sandy anymore, Sandy anymore because of Jimmy. Sa Jimmy one time, uh, uh, Sandy one time said to me, where did everybody go? I said, who, Sandy? And he goes, you know, he started rattling off names. And I told him, I go, Sandy, he, he makes it hard for me to come to the house. You know, he, 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 he's a gatekeeper. So Jimmy, in my opinion, was a, a, had a lot of insecurity and ego. God bless him, he's doing the best he could, but he was living in this big man's shadow, and the older Sandy got, the more protective he got. And when he saw, and this, Jimmy had dedicated his life to Sandy and, his, and supporting him from, from behind the scenes, like a, like a great partner can do. 
He was willing to take the, the back seat and support and run things and run the, the logistics and the bills and so Sandy could just teach. So believe me, he was a, gr a great asset for Sandy and helped in many ways. And when Sandy was older and he, he, faith, his health was failing, um, Jimmy was there to, to, to take care of him too. So I'm going to be clear about that. But as Sandy's getting closer to the end, the money's, the, 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 any source of income is over. There's no retirement plan. There's no, you know, Sandy taught till, till he couldn't speak another breath. He was never retiring. But when he stopped teaching, there went the source of income. And so Jimmy started, uh, as he saw that approaching, he, he, he opened the James Carville Sanford Meisner School of Acting in Los Angeles. A year before, Sandy had asked me to head up this vision. He wanted to create a place for his now L.A. graduates to have a place to continue to work and grow. Similar to the concept of the actor's studio, he wanted a place for his alumni to stay in game shape while in Hollywood, both his current students that just graduated, and he also wanted to keep the, the program going. And he asked me if I would be willing to take over this, take the reins of this. And at that meeting was Bob Carnegie and myself. And, and Bob said, you know, I, I can't help in any way. I've got my own school to run. It would be a conflict. And I said to Sandy, Sandy, I don't want to do that. I, I know I'll someday I'll teach, but I, I, I'm 31 years old, 32 years old. I want to be an actor. This is what I want to do. I don't, I don't want that yet. Okay. And in that moment, I'll just say that Jimmy Carville was not thrilled because they were positive I was going to say yes. And eventually they found somebody else. And that eventually came the Sanford Meisner Center, I believe it was called. But prior to that, um, and so they went to New York and they found somebody that would be willing to come out and take that position and let uh, and, ha and create a relationship. I don't know what the contract was. I don't know what the agreement was for this person to be the head of this of their school. Um, but there was an arrangement made. Eventually that arrangement after Sandy passed, it blew up and Jimmy pulled his support of that of that school. And he lent that support to another teacher, ironically. Uh, somebody who assisted under this guy. Um, I, I don't know if you want me to name, you know, I don't, you can name, name you, you can fill in the details. Well, is that uh, Martin Barter, right? Yeah, Mar Martin is the guy that they found in New York to come out and do this. And I, I've never met him. I certainly, our paths have crossed over the years. I'm sure he's a fine, fine man and teacher. Um, and he certainly got a chance to spend some time. He'd already been teaching back east. Uh, when they found him, and, and so he, they plugged him in, and he took over and, and built that up, and I don't even know what it's doing these days. But one of his assistants, uh, students, uh, I think was assisting under him, his name was Alex Taylor, they had a falling out. And when that falling out happened, he established a school, and Jimmy went to him, uh, and through his support, and Alex was marketing himself as the only teacher in the world who has the blessing of the Meisner estate. Uh, and this is a way of, for Jimmy to continue to get a source of income by throwing his support to a, to a situation. Okay, okay. Now there's a, somebody who's teaching my, uh, and I don't know all the details, I've just heard about this, but he's teaching, uh, he's giving Meisner teaching certificates online. I, I don't know how it works, I don't know how the classes work, but basically you can get certified to teach the Meisner technique. This person never studied with Sandy. He studied with teachers of teachers who did. Um, so he's offering teaching certificates and his legitimacy is that he helped Jimmy Carville write this book. This book that Jimmy wrote, um, it was, it's really, it's Jimmy's story of, of, of he and Sandy and their adopted son, Boo. It's their story of their journey and, and, and from everything. Okay, and, and um, so this guy helped him write the book his name is Scott. I don't know how to pronounce his last name. I don't know who cooked up the idea, but when it finally came with the idea, now the Meisner estate is, su supports this program of teaching certificates. Again, I'm sure Scott's a nice guy. Uh, I, ha I have heard of his name over the years from the Playhouse because that's where he came from. Um, but in terms of teaching the Meisner, t you know, teaching, giving teaching certificates online, um, you can do it. Uh, w uh, yeah, and and just consider the source, and and I'm not saying that it's some horrible thing. I'm just saying that just ask Scott. Did you study with Sandy? What are your qualifications to offer teaching certificates? And if you like that answer, then then go for it. 
But I'm just telling, this is the history. And this is how political it gets. You have to understand, <laughs> you know, not only did, did, did Jimmy not care for me because of how close I was with Sandy, but the turning point was, was when I opened my play on Sandy uh, Meisner. When Jimmy found out about that, he lost his mind. He was in Beckwe in the West Indies. He called from Beckwe, threatening to sue me. I'd already done all my due diligence. I knew Jimmy was coming. I knew that this is what would happen. And on the phone, I offered him. I said, look, you know, I've cleared everything with lawyers. I have everything legal buttoned down. Um, that said, you know, I want to honor you and Bulu, Sandy's legacy. I will give you a percentage, a tithing, every time I perform the show. When I first opened it in LA, I gave all proceeds from a three-week run to Jimmy, handed him a check for it. Um, and trying to, trying to get him to uh, not be so divisive. Um, he took the check, but that was it. We never spoke again. And when he published his book, he makes a list in the back of the people that were, uh, that were, author, that were uh, legitimate teachers of the Meisner technique that studied with Sandy. I'm not in that list. I'm not in that list. I'm not in the list where people that aren't legitimate, but students who are teaching the technique. I'm not even on that list. So I know why. I, I knew when that book came out and somebody called and said, uh, and I go, yeah, yeah, that's big surprise. So Jimmy had always, we, did, we had a falling out many years ago, but so had most everybody. That's why I, I brought up, and granted, this is, my, this is my version of events, but I'm, I'm being as honest as I possibly can, and it can be verified by a bunch of people because it's, it's these former, t these teachers that I'm telling you about who had the exact same relationship because they were so close with Sandy as well that they became ostracized. They became excommunicated in that uh, world. So there it is. Can we talk a little bit about your play? Because I've heard about your play. We were supposed to have you uh, tour it in Paris. Uh, it was very complicated for me, but I've heard from many different people that your play was amazing and very inspiring and very true to uh, Sandy Meissner. And you told me maybe it would be made into a film, which I think is a great idea. Can you talk a little bit about this? Sure, sure. Well, I, you know, it's funny. Even on my playbill, I don't even wrote, I don't, I don't put written by Jim Jarrett. I didn't write it. Sandy wrote it. Sandy dictated it. I somehow, through the grace of God, got to be with Sandy at the end of his life when he spoke so poorly. And I was a horrible student my whole educational career. I didn't take any notes when I was going through grade school, high school, or college. And all of a sudden, I'm in Sandy's class. I'm writing down everything he's saying. Every thing from two years as a student, then two years assisting and mentoring, and anything in between. And so it's from these 15 notebooks that I created the show, and I'll try to be brief, the epiphany for it was I was already touring a show that had just blown up in the most positive way. It's a one-man show on Vincent Van Gogh, authored by Leonard Nimoy. By that, that would do well in Paris too, by the way. Um, I've been touring, that. I'm no longer touring full-time anymore at all, but you know that was 23 or four years ago that I was introduced to the show, and I'm about year three or four into the tour, and um, uh, I'm in, uh, where am I? Uh, uh, Manila. And uh, I'm asked to give the keynote speech to the International Theater Festival. And it's a packed hall of several thousand, about 1,500 people. And I'm like, what do you, you want me to talk about? San they wanted me to talk about Sanford Meisner. They, they just, it was in, it's the International Theater Festival. And they wanted me to talk about, you know, my time with Sandy, just it's, anything about Sandy, not the technique, just Sandy. And I was like, will they even know who he, he was? Because like you said earlier, he didn't, like Lee, Lee Strasberg was a great marketer. Lee Strasberg got a publicist and an agent, and that's not a criticism, it's a great marketing. Sandy freaking died in a crappy little house in the valley. Uh, he, 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 he didn't teach for a dollar bill. There's only 20 students in Sandy's class. There's several hundred in Stella's. You had to wait months, to, you had to audit for months because people would do it. And they paid a ton of money to be part of class. And same thing with other quote unquote great teachers. Sandy didn't teach for a dollar bill either. And so his classes were small. I, so I talked, I got up and I told stories about Sandy. I just, I was given a half hour. I spoke for a half hour and I just talked about him. I talked about what he stood for, what he believed, how he believed that to be an actor was important, that it was a noble, noble profession. What we're doing is important. We matter to have a voice on this planet and to do such work in an elevated way, you raise up the script, you, you raise up the, the vision, and you raise up the experience. The more truthful and believable your work is, the more it will impact the audience because you cannot fake real. You can't fake truth, you can't fake real emotion. 
And the more you learn how to step in and turn that cold piece of paper into a believable human being, the more impactful it'll be. I finished the talk and it was like a church revival. I'm not kidding you. And it's not me. They, they were all, they wanted to talk about Sandy. So I, I came down from the stage, the talk was over, and there's a line going all the way almost out the door of people who want to come up and say something to me. Some people do want an autograph or they want something, whatever, but most everybody just wanted to either ask more about Sandy. Uh, they were just captivated by him. And while in that line, I literally, I, I did one of these. I was talking to somebody and I leaned out and saw how far back the line went. And I'm in there to do my show, Vincent, that ends up being one of the hits of the festival. And in that moment, I'm going, oh my God, this is going to be my next show. It, was in a, it wasn't me. It just came like out of freaking nowhere. I'm going, I'm going, to, I'm, going to do, I'm going to do a show on Sandy. And as I flew home, 17-hour flight on that laptop, I basically started creating the show from my notes. I knew I didn't want it to be, I did not, this was not, the, it's not called the Meisner technique. It's called Meisner. I wanted to be able to bring this show to people who especially were not Meisner trained, actors who, who got a sound bite that he was horrible or it was great or this or that, or people that studied allegiance to some other completely different discipline that they could at least come and meet this artistic genius. So as I went through my, all my notes that had been transcribed, I go, no, 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 too technique too actor only. No, no, no. I wanted you to be able to bring your, your partner, your spouse, your boyfriend, your girlfriend, your best friend, your mom, and have them go, oh my God, I get it. I get you, you know, because it's not about technique. It's about a great teacher who changed your, their, your life forever because of their passion, their integrity, their, their, they're, they're, they're challenged for you to step up and be, step into your brilliance and be better, you know? So, so that's, so it made it very easy to, knowing that, it made it very easy to know what to put in there. Sometimes I would, I would, because I, I, I had transcribed all of my notes. So day 22, you know, this couple, this is what happened, and I've got, the, I've got everything. And, and now Sandy's feedback, and I would take a sentence from this day, and a paragraph from that day, and two and a half pages from that day. You know what I mean? In other words, just cut and paste. When I first did the show, it was almost four hours, I swear to God. <laughs> I didn't do it for a live audience. I was just kicking the tires, but I couldn't, oh my God, how do, I, how do you get rid of all these brilliant, and not me, him, him, him. So basically, I took 2,000 hours of his brilliance and I condensed it as best I could into a two-hour experience of what it's like, what it was like to be a student of Sandy's. But as I said, we've stripped away the technique and yet there are so many incredible exchanges that happen between, it wasn't just him teaching, it's not me just teaching, we actually have a, created a way to have Sandy interact with students. There's six couples that, that during the course of the evening I as Sandy interact with and teach off of because those exchanges were so powerful. One of my favorites is this one where a girl, she quits. She just, she, 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 that day in class, as Sandy was working with her and pounding on her, not in some horrible way, trying to get her to open up and be real and be present and dig deeper, she just lost it. She started crying. And, and he thought she was crying because there might be a little bit of a breakthrough. And finally she stopped and she looked up and she goes, Sandy, I can't do this anymore. And he goes, what, what? And she goes, this this and she starts crying again that happened and we've recreated it by casting of this brilliant actress who who crushes it and it's it's hard to describe I don't want to give too much away how we have recreated this but it's pretty magical how it happens how it dissolves on and off and the dance happens and also another cool thing I think that's really neat is obviously I studied with Sandy at the, near the end of his life where his voice was so compromised. All of his physical capabilities were compromised except this thing. This thing was never, it was as sharp as ever, more brilliant than ever. He struggled sometimes to get it all out, but that's why he was so efficient and judicious when he spoke. Um, but I couldn't spend, I couldn't do an entire show where I'm old Sandy. It just, it was too, it would take, we would only get through this much content. So I made the decision to take the same teachings, but give it to them. Get, so the first act, it's in the 50s. It's 1955. The second act, it's 1985. It's 30 years difference. When I walk on stage in the first act, I'm Sandy, age 55. When I walk on stage the second act, I'm Sandy, age 85. And now in the second act, you get, a, you get to experience 
uh, what a warrior he was, how hard it was for him, and how he was more of a purist than ever before uh, about what he did and what he dedicated his life to and how freaking adorable he was. Um, you really, the second act really melts your heart. Uh, you, you, you really fall in love with him. In the first act, you might, at intermission, be like, God, because he's, he's a lot, man. And when I shared it with his alumni who studied with him during those eras, I got a chance to meet with Sidney Pollock and Mary Steenburgen and John Voigt and Mark Rydell to say, hey, this is when you, you were with Sandy. I can only picture, I'm projecting what he would have been like uh, uninhibited, uh, uh, healthy. I'm picturing, I know how he was. I know how feisty he was at that age with all those limitations. I just figured in the 50s, he was, it was like this. I need your help. I don't know. Am I, am I close? Is it accurate? And the first time I ever performed it for uh, Bill Alderson in L.A., he came back at intermission and said, don't change a thing. It's perfect. So it made me feel comfortable that the first act, Sandy, was, and I've obviously continued to hone and, and perfect it. But there it is. That's the show. It's a chance to experience this artistic genius and what made him so um, unforgettable and life-changing. When I do the show for actors, it tends to have the exact same response wherever I do it, whether it's New York, LA, or in a, in a strong market of actors, and that is that it, it's incredibly impactful. It's incredibly inspiring. Again, not me. I didn't write it. I just did my very best to, to shape his brilliance. Like I said, cut and paste, cut and paste. Here's, he's talking about preparation on this day, this day, this day, this year. Boom, boom, boom. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Move it around, boom, there it is. There's a, and some days I didn't have to do nothing. I just went boom, boom, you know? So it's really, I just get in chills. It's really cool, I think. Not me, again, nothing to do with me. It's him, but it's a really cool experience. It's very interesting to have this idea of interacting with students, uh, like in your show, you know, because I feel like it's very hard to just explain the technique without seeing the interaction, and because the technique itself is based on interactions, you know. Right. Uh, so yeah. it's like uh, it's very interesting. Like, how would you describe uh, to uh, you know, without having the whole show to uh, to display uh, to someone, uh, you know, an actor's mom or an actor's uh, uh, you know, wife or husband, as you said, that someone who isn't an actor and uh, who has some cliche ideas about acting, what, what it is, maybe it's being emotional, maybe it's, you know, talking very loud. Like, how would you describe the Meissner technique and what it is all about? Sure, for sure. Well, you know, the Meissner technique is, is all about not acting. The Meissner technique is all about truth. It's all about getting out of your head and working from your gut. It's all about becoming the most moment-to-moment, -moment, organic, instinctive, improvisational, free, liberated, healthy machine. Um, there's a perception out there of actors. You know, if you, any, any of you who are watching this who are, who are actors, to the point that you actually say that in public and not with shame, with pride, what do you do? I'm an actor. People right away, it's like, you might as well told them you're a freaking unicorn. They, they, like, they don't know what the hell to do with that. Oh, oh are you method? They, that's always method. See, anyone said, you're more method actors than more method actors. There's 250,000 completely different method acting teachers in this city alone. He was talking about New York City. This is a direct quote. It's from the play. There are 250,000 method actors in this city alone, all with their own misinterpretation of what the original method was all about. All about. And then they run around and say they teach the method like it has some cohesive meaning. So again, it's just been so watered down and diluted. People think that if you go live the part, you know, in second year in the training, my God, you know, you, it's all about learning how to transform beyond your natural self, playing your natural self and learning how to not play a character, but earn it and how to go beyond playing, earning, being your natural selves, being able to truly transform and it goes beyond makeup and wigs and an accent and it's craft to be able to do that so to a lay person most people think that actors are just really good bullshitters you're just really good you know you're are you you're crying are you you know you're acting you're they just think you're always bullshitting and unfortunately that's true of so much acting back to the community theater thing it's so much acting going on it's 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 like i it's like junk food experience you know and, and yet the miser technique is the opposite of that. It is, it is 
all about authenticity. It's all about falling into the most free, liberated version of you. The genesis of the technique here, this probably isn't well known. Sandy, Sandy once said to me, I should have been put in prison for what I taught for the first almost 10 years of my career because I didn't know what I, I was teaching what I was taught and I knew it was wrong. I knew there were things about the method that were not, that, that made you even more in your head, made you more introverted than ever. I, I knew it, I could feel it and I could see it, but I didn't know what else. There was no acting teacher. The profession acting teacher, if you had to fill out your taxes in the 30s in the United States, no one wrote acting teacher because there was no teachers. There was no craft, there was no, there was no craft. There were directors, but there was no way. And that was what's so revolutionary about what, what Konstantin Stanislavski did and brought to this country and why people glommed onto it. There was finally a, a way to possibly not just have the stars line up to have a good performance go off, that, that there was a, possibly a way, but then it became like an obsession, obsession and a religion and then misinterpreted. And then of course there's plenty of healthy interpretations. It's not about that. I'm not, I don't want to, I'm not bagging on the method at all. To thine own self be true. If it works for you, beautiful. But Sam, I'm teaching, I'm telling you, Sam, Sandy's relationship with this, and that is he knew there were inherent problems. Of course, there's the obvious. He was violently opposed to emotional memory. He, he wants the opposite for his actors. If it works for you, go ahead, he would say. But personally, I don't want you to have to go relive your past over and over again. I want you to heal that sh stuff so that you're not constantly uh, limited by it. He wanted us... The, 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 the tortured artist paradigm Sandy was violently against. You didn't, he said you don't need a screwed up life to be an actor. And in fact, the more screwed up it is, the worse chance you have of sticking around. And I, boy, is that true. You know, he wanted us healthy. And instead of a, a screwed up childhood or these tormented wounds, etc., he wanted us not only to heal those, he wanted us to develop the most important thing for an actor, your imagination. Because with a vivid imagination, there's just about no place you can't go. And none of this is real in the first place. Hamlet ain't real, he would say. It's a play. You're supposed to play. Play, he'd scream at us. You know? So, so the, the, the tech, oh, oh, so at a party, he had a, he had a, a date and he kept introducing her. This is out in the Hamptons. It was a summer garden party, beach pool party, whatever. Outdoor, big Hampton party, some rich people's house. And he kept introducing him to all these New York socialites, this woman introducing her. And she kept, she goes, what's his name? What's his name? And finally he goes, don't you pay attention? And she goes, no, do you? And a light bulb went off. He goes, my God, no one listens. People are horrible listeners. No wonder we don't remember names. Something so basic, it seemed like a good time to show up and listen is when someone's telling you their name, they turn away, we can't even tell. We have so much chaos going on. We have so much going on anyway. It, Sandy wasn't over-evaluating at this point. He just had an epiphany. He went, oh my God, people are horrible listeners. And then the number one fear of most people is getting up in front of other people. So now bad listening goes to worse. He goes, no wonder everyone's acting. No wonder nothing believable or truthful is happening. And that's in that moment, he said, okay, I'm going to stop trying to teach character and script interpretation, script and all these other technical things that get people even more in their head and make them more heady. I'm going to, nothing believable or interesting will ever happen until I get you to show up. Even if your partner doesn't show up, you can still show up off of nothing. It's not as good. It's not as good. It won't be as good. It's only as strong as the weakest link, but you can't worry about the other person. And if the other person has to be incredibly well-trained, it being present. Now you have, because nothing believable or interesting will happen between two actors until that happens on a whole nother level, if both are. And if only one is, guess what? Then, then there you are. So, so that was the genesis of Sandy cr trying to figure out this, again, this trailblazer. He didn't have mentors at this point. This is, he's trying to find his own way. He's trying to find his way. And it eventually becomes known throughout the world as the Meisner Technique. He never called it the Meisner Technique. He just called it a, you know, his class where he's trying to teach you how to be present and truthful and real. And he just, you know, he'd try this and a little bit of that. And over the first 20, 30 years, it wasn't until about the, the early mid-60s that Sandy said that everything became crystallized and solidified. He really didn't tweak it much beyond that over the next, th whatever, 25 years. Um, Certain classes, he would leave out certain things because they either just, they did, he, he, he would punish classes if they weren't working hard enough. The class behind me, he took away Spoon Rivers. They were like a week and a half, two weeks into him, he took them away. 
He goes, he's just, you all, you all don't give a damn. It's a waste of time, you know? Yeah. So that kind of stuff happened. But he, it's, you know, I've heard people say, well, he was constantly changing until the very end. That's not, that's not accurate. That certainly wasn't my experience. I look at my notes from when I was a student, and then as a, it's, they're almost identical. Hell, there, there's so much similarity in Dennis Longwell's book. Uh, who, who wrote the book? That's the one with the picture of Sandy on the cover. There's almost verb. It's like all. It's like those are the because it's just a year or two before I started studying with them. It's, it's the same stuff. Now the Dennis Longwell's book was is not a teaching syllabus. Unfortunately, a lot of people treated it that way. He was a fly on the wall. He was a writer in the class. Tons of stuff was left out. Trust me, um, in terms of the of the brick by brick. So it's convoluted and it's all over the well, all over the places overseas. It's a brilliant book. It's brilliant, brilliant at capturing Sandy's genius, but it's not a teaching syllabus of the Miser technique, nor was it ever intended to be. Nor did Sandy want, he once said, read the preface of the book. He says you can't, he goes, I was asked so many times to write a book about the Miser technique, and I tried several times, and finally I gave it up because I realized not only can't it be done, it shouldn't be done. Now, since then, it has been, and it helps. Can it help? Can you understand some things, especially if you have some, um, some knowledge and get some clarity? Absolutely, it can you know, can you learn the Meisner technique online? I get asked this question all the time. Oh my goodness, can you introduce some basic principles of first session online to a group? Okay, yeah. Can you take advanced students and do some exercise via Zoom here and there? Yeah, you know, if the exercise means that, you know, if the truth of it is that it's always because we're having a phone call together, that has to be the exercise, that has to be the scenario. There are certain limited things you can do, for sure. But can you, in my opinion, teach the Meisner technique online that way by having students do working moment to moment via Zoom, whether as the exercises, as it grows brick, brick by brick, or working on scenes with the limitations and everything of Zoom? No. Is it done? Oh yeah, oh yeah. Now, you know, this is something we're working towards. You know, now, if you had a hot set and, and stream the classes, can you learn the Meisner technique, live it, watching classes by, a, by teachers who are qualified to teach as an auditor? You basically would be an auditor, but you're not learning the actual technique in terms of a practical way you know, and yet one of the things that we're also exploring is is working with students, being able to have it set up where they're not on Zoom, they're in they're in front of me on a monitor just like you are, and if with the proper cameras and lighting, absolutely could a qualified teacher teach off that work. So there's some exceptions, but I'm just trying to say that so many people out there are literally because they can't gather, they can't come together, and they don't know any other way. They're trying to literally teach the technique online to two people working moment to moment via Zoom or whatever. Can you do that? Well, you can, it's being done. I would personally never do it. And on top of that, of course, you miss the experience of the class going, growing together and going through the experience. And come second year, by the way, it would be impossible because you need your classmates for so many parts of the different exercises. Thank you very much. Yeah, you talked about uh, Denis Longwell uh, book on acting uh, and I'd like to ask you uh, questions about a few of my snow books. Uh, you told me last time about uh, an experience with the uh, Larry Silverberg's series when you yeah. first stumbled well, on so that. Well, look, you know, I don't know what Larry claims these days in terms of, here, here, I'll, here, let me do it this way. This is exactly how it went down. I'm in Samuel French Bookstore in Los Angeles in 19, I'm going to guess around 90, 90, 91, 91, 92. I, don't quote me, but it's close. Anyway, I'm in Samuel French, and right at the counter, I'm buying some books. There's a book, and it's called The, My the Miser Technique by Larry Silverberg. And I'm like, what? I knew of the Dennis Longwell book, and up to that point, that was the only book out there. And I bought it, and I was actually, ironically, headed to Sandy's that day. And I, sh I knock on the door. Jimmy opens the door. I get escorted to Sandy. I go, hey, Sandy. I go, Who what's this? Who's this? And Sandy looks at it, and he goes, oh, and the fuck is Larry Silverberg? I go, you don't know, you don't, and he goes, I've never heard of him. I've never heard of, who is this? And I was the one that began the, this nightmare because eventually the, the state reached out and it had to get changed to the, the Meisner approach, the, Larry, the Meisner approach. Now, 
Larry, I don't know who he studied with, uh, uh, but he has done very well at writing a bunch of books about the Meisner technique. And um, uh, there's people, you know, I love this one. I hear uh, master teacher. I saw somebody the other day, uh, I get these Google alerts about Meisner teachers and Meisner technique worldwide. And there's a master teacher out of New York City. I've never heard of him. He never studied with Sandy. And he's a master teacher of the Meisner technique. Check this out. So one time Sandy got called, you know, well, you're a master teacher. And I have this quote on my website because Sandy goes, he goes, if, you ever ha if anyone ever calls himself a master teacher, run. Run from them. That's ego. He goes, I'm a ma I haven't mastered anything. I, I am just dedicated to truth. That's classic Sandy, classic his hu humility. Um, so so, so uh, there are a lot of people who make claims that they were, uh, that they're this or they're that. And Larry has done, he's been doing this now for a good 30 years. Yeah, that's about right. And he's written a lot of books. And can you learn some things? Sure. Can you, can you um, especially if you have some information? Can, sure. I've never read them. I don't, you know, I've, I've read a little bit of that very first one 30 years ago and never have read another since then. Um, uh, let's see, what do I want to say? Um, I think that he, I'm positive that he's a, a good person who means well and um, and there it is. But I just know that uh, uh, that book, his sharing these teachings this way, Sandy was not happy with at all. And um, that I'm positive of. And uh, nor did he want it presented like that, especially by someone who wasn't trained by him to teach. And so that, that's, that's what I remember. Thank you very much. There's also, there's also two things that come to mind in terms of books. There's one book that is called Meissner in Practice, which basically teaches uh, repetition. I haven't really read it, but uh, what I saw, it teaches repetition by like thinking, like matching the other person, breathing pattern, and like trying to breathe like them as you're doing the repetition exercise and stuff that to me seem completely antagonistic to. Yeah, Sandy never did that, but hey, you know, there it is. People are gonna make it their own if they choose to. And that doesn't mean that's necessarily a, a bad thing. Let's go back to Tony Montez. You know, he, he now teaches his own thing. And he's pulling from all of his different teachers and presenting that. Beautiful. All I will ever do as a teacher is teach the Meisner technique exactly how Sandy wanted it presented. I know I'm not quite answering your question, but that, that's, that's it. I'm not going to change it. I'm not going to turn it into an intensive or a workshop. And, and again, you can do it. You can, you can do a six-week inter, introductory class and give the basics. There's nothing wrong with that. But what happens, I find, there's a teacher here in the Bay Area a while ago. She was teaching second-year stuff in that six-week course. That's criminal. That's, 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 then people go, wow, this miser thing was hard. It was difficult. I didn't get it. It was stupid. It was this, but, but. You, you, get, you didn't get it. You, you, got this, you got this completely cobbled, bastardized version of it. It's not, it, there's a reason why it's supposed to be presented in this way. He, when the students, our students who go through the training the, to a person will tell you, oh my God, as it builds and grows, you start, you, you, you start appreciating, appreciating Sandy's genius on a whole nother level. You realize why this had to happen before this could happen. Why it, and for some students it can be very, they're impatient. They want it to go quicker. I got it, I got it, I got it. Well, guess what? We're trying to build a house on a foundation that's rock solid. I got that you got it. And we're gonna pound those, pulse, those pillars in a little bit deeper and a little bit more solid too. So it's second nature, not just you got it. I'm talking second nature. So for some people, in, in taking them on the journey we take them on, they might feel a little impatient at times, but to a person, at some point, they go, got it, get it, understand why. I understand Sandy's genius. I understand, you know, that, that, that he had a reason for all this, presented this way and in this order. Yes. And, and uh, that leads me to uh, my next question, which is uh, uh, if there was someone out there, maybe not 
perfectly teaching Meissner yet or just an acting teacher teaching whatever technique or take of a technique uh, they might teach. Um, and if they wanted your advice on how to approach teaching a class, uh, what would you say? What is your mindset? What are your goals? What is your point of view on the students in terms of pedagogy and like, uh, uh, you know, trying to bring the most to a, a classroom? This you can teach. If you've got someone out there teaching who has some understanding, I get this all the time and I don't even market it. I get people reaching out from all over the world saying, hey, I want to be better at this. And I know that I studied with somebody who studied with somebody who may have studied with Sandy and, and yet I care and yet I really want to do this better and right. I get this all the time. Hell, that's why I'm invited to come in and talk to the students and then, and then I have workshops with the faculty at, at universities or in situations. So, you know, that's a possibility. Now with COVID these days, it's done obviously more via Zoom. I also uh, offer uh, and we'll be creating even more opportunities for people, students and teachers from around the world to mentor under me responsibly. Again, I'm not going to do it in some, yeah, in a way that actually can be done, that makes, that benefits you. Um, so I guess my advice would be, and this isn't an infomercial for me, I'm saying that if you're a teacher out there and you want to be better, do what you're doing. You, you've been a beautiful example of that. You have reached out to uh, some of the more l legitimate people in this world for years now trying to get clarity, trying to get better, you know, and because of your sincerity, I mean, I've, I've had people do this who uh, you can tell they're just takers. They're very, very self-serving. There's ego. And I, I, I'll cut it short quickly and I won't continue that exchange. I'm too busy and there's too many other people who are who are open, healthy, and sincere about it, and humble. If your teacher has ego in any way, shape, or form, man, that's a red flag. Sandy could be tough, but he once said, he goes, I, he, goes I, I, he goes, the only ego I have goes into trying to teach you to the best of my ability. Sandy didn't have ego. It wasn't about him. It was about, it was about, he cared so much about truth, and he didn't care who, who did it, and if you were being a dog about it, if he wants, you know, you're trying to get it at too cheap a price, if you were, Casual, he had no time for that. Those are, that's not ego, that's standards. That's a respect. Hell, I feel that way too, especially the older I get. I have absolutely no time for casual. I have had no time for people who want this at too cheap a price. You can't buy your chair at my school. You've got to earn it. It's all on you. That's the good news. And by earn it, I just mean work hard. Work hard. Practice hard. Be open, humble, teachable. This is world-class training, man. It comes at a price. It's, a, it's an opportunity to have a foundation built on rock, but you've got to help me build it. You've got to meet me halfway. You know? So, 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 but back to the... So, if there's a teachers out there listening to this, reach out, not you know, to me, to anybody that you respect, that you feel is legitimate, and, and get clarification, and, or buy these books, or read these things. But again, there's just so much out there from people positioning themselves... That's why I just say, if people tell you they studied with Sandy, just, just do a little checklist. Wonderful, great. When? What years? For how long? Did you complete the training? Were you trained to teach too? And if you get yes, 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 bump, 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 well, and I'm telling you, these days that, that list has dwindled to like four on the planet that were trained by him as a student, trained as a teacher, have Sandy's blessing, not Jimmy Carville's or whatever, Sandy's blessing to teach, um, there it is. It's a short list. And, it, and, and just because somebody, Sandy's long gone. He's been p passed away now for t 25 years, going on 25 years. You know, there's a whole new wave of people who did study with those teachers. The Scott guy that I'm talking about, I, 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 I tr tr trust, trust, I don't know. Trust, trust, okay. Again, He's, he's aligned with the Meisner estate. That gives it extra credibility and validation for sure. But I am 1,000% positive he never studied with Sandy. Does that mean he's a bad teacher? Of course not. Does that mean he's a horrible person? Of course not. But if you're going to get a teaching certificate, let's say, from somebody who did study with Sandy and somebody who didn't, actually, that's not fair because somebody who did might be a jerk too. They might have ego. and So just look, just trust your gut. <laughs> just trust your gut, but do your vetting. Because there's just a lot of, a lot of misinformation, and you don't know the whole story.
Uh, yeah, so you talked about uh, uh, dates. Uh, what year, like, do you have uh, in mind the years uh, when Meissner stopped teaching? Sandy stopped teaching in 1993. Full he stopped teaching uh, really in 92 is when his health really fell down. He could not get the volume even with the speaker. He was so tired. Uh, you know, his, he just was ravaged. And so he would have to cancel a lot of classes, cut classes short. Uh, Jimmy tried to sit in, but he had to take care of Sandy at home when his health was failing. So classes were getting canceled a lot, delayed, etc. Even in when I was studying with Sandy, there was several stretches where we didn't have class for several weeks because Sandy's health was struggling. But he always snapped back better than before. But that's from 87 to 89. Even by 91, you could see Sandy slowing down for sure. By 92, it was clear he probably should have quit teaching right around there. That's not a, uh, uh, to discredit him. I just mean in terms of his own health. Not his, his mind was fine. It was his ability to communicate it now it had diminished so much. It was just really hard. So that's all I mean by that. And by 93, he never taught again. So those are the years. And he passed in 97, February 2nd, 1997. I think you are one of the purists of the Meissner technique, meaning you teach, you teach it, I, I believe, uh, the way he taught it. Um, I'm not a purist myself in that sense that, uh, you know, uh, like I feel like everyone who's claiming to teach Meissner should research and study it completely, um, especially if they're going to use their name. But I think like any technique, you know, uh, uh, it's whatever works for the actor. And also we discover new things, it can be improved. I believe, do, do you think that the Meissner technique can be improved? Have you yourself, uh, is there anything that you bring in probably from your personality or different ways you teach it that you found valuable for the students? Well, I love your question. You know, again, it, it, of course, I, every time I teach, I'm bringing me in. I'm doing my best. I'll read Sandy's words. I'll read his words his teachings on this new brick. We're at this part of the technique now. I'm going to share with you Sandy's words on this. And I get to share all these beautiful teachings, right? And then I'll shut the book and I'll go, all right, questions. And the questions start, you know, the confusion of this or what did that. And I'll try my very best to help uh, uh, break it down and make it maybe a little more accessible. I certainly, along the way, when we're talking about, you know, learn, understanding the importance of doing, the reality of doing, uh, such a tenant to the to the next phase after repetition, uh, and I can show film clips, for example, of of not just Meisner actors, just people doing their doings strongly and truthfully, and just as you can teach off of false moments. So I have specialty classes from time to time where I'll offer up and be able to teach off of the training, if that makes sense. But you know, sometimes almost to a fault, I am uh, such a purist. He put the foundation to my dream in place. I came to him a 29-year-old kid with a, with a freaking broken heart trying to figure out this is what I thought I was here to do. And this artistic genius put my foundation to my dream in place. He changed my life forever for the good. I have had this privileged career of touring the world and being a part of a, of a show in particular that's all about, on Vincent Van Gogh, that's all about passion and dreams and courage, all the reasons I wanted to become an actor and the impact it has on audiences and how Sandy believed that to be an actor was a noble profession, that you could change people's lives forever if you worked on material that stood for something and your, your sense of truth could match that. And I've, ha I've experienced it. So my gratitude to Sandy, one, one time I got interviewed and somebody says, aren't you concerned that you're just always going to be in his shadow, that you're going to, you know, you're always going to be known as Sanford Meisner's last teaching protege. And I'm like, you say that like it's a bad thing. <laughs> I, I'm good with that, man. I'm good. If that's all I'm known for is this guy who did his very best to honor his teacher and, and the purity of these teachings. You want to go change him? You want to go add, knock yourself out? You, you found a different way to do Cool. Good. That's why I say I don't, I, I'm not competing against anybody. I'm not trying to, I'm going to teach Sandy's way exactly how he wanted it presented. That's what I'm going to do. That's what I'm dedicated to. And yet, yet, of course, it's me driving the bus. It's me teaching it. So I can't help but bring myself into it. But I understand the material so well after all these years as well. I think that's a good thing. 
as a teacher, have you uh, noticed any specific uh, sticking points? Like, is there any part of the technique that you feel is uh, a very uh, difficult thing that for everyone is kind of harder in terms of learning the Meister technique? I think one of the biggest mistakes people make, teachers out there make, is they think that it's about repeating. I, I've seen so many, like I said earlier, people that have had previous Meister technique training, pe previous repetition experience, it's, 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 it was presented improperly. They think it's about repeating. It's not about repeating. It's about communicating and being wide open and being affected. It's not about mindless repetition, repeating, repeat. I see that a lot. I know that's not quite your question, but it's something that clearly is a hurdle for uh, a lot of teachers to understand. Now that should shift immediately. I mean like second, third class of repetition being introduced. It's not about repeating, this mechanical repeating. As far as what's, what tends to be a, a difficult next step, a difficult brick in the, in the technique is, you know what, I gotta be honest with you, it's funny, is you're, I've never asked, been asked that question, I think it's a great question, and my mind's just going, because I think it's, it's every time you introduce something new, a new brick, a new dimension. That's why, again, the Meiser technique ain't the repetition exercise. It's gonna grow and expand, but on top of that, what it grows and expands to and what it allows to be introduced on top of that. So as soon as you start adding the three elements, people tend to start playing it. They violate the being present and working from their gut. They start playing their urgency. They start playing the exercise. Uh, so that can be a hurdle. When people are first introduced to the door and have to come to the door and come through the door but leave it, leave their reason for knocking, that, that can be very difficult. They tend to want to hang on to it and make it about them. That's not, it's just for the knock. And so, and, and then now then I'm now thinking of what happens next in second session and what happens in third. And they're all, they're all can be bumpy. They all can be a little bit difficult for people. To be able to not, I always say this all the time, guys, don't compare yourself to anybody else in here. Everyone's struggle and epiphanies are gonna happen at different times, you know? And some of you might sail through one section, this new introduction quite smoothly. Others might really struggle. You know, one step forward, two back, be patient. But I, I think that it just, it depends on the student, and I think, honestly, the entire training, when presented properly, you'll find some elements trickier than others. Um, as far as myself goes, uh, you know, I certainly had problems for a while with preparation, uh, really understanding it, uh, what it, the purity of it, what he really wanted from it. I can remember struggling with what starts to get too conversational in the technique, what, what because it's, it's supposed to grow, it's supposed to grow. When, it, when brilliant, when well-trained, when properly trained, well-trained, hard-working Meisner students are doing advanced work, it should sound almost conversation. It shouldn't sound like some basic repetition. My God, it's supposed to grow. And it's not that they're not working off of the moment, they're just so free and instinctive. It's, you, you can't do the repetition exercise out on a, on a set. You know, you, you, you've got to learn how it's supposed to be a, a means to an end and how it's supposed to serve. And I certainly struggled with that transition too. And that comes more really, well, no, that happens in first year for sure. That happens in first year. And then I think one of the most liberating chapters it happens near the end of first year with the fantasy exercises, almost to a student. There's major breakthroughs with those exercises, but that's because of the build. That's because of everything of where we're at as a, as a whole together. Yes, some people might be a little more here or here, or here with where we're at, but we're all here, we're in the same boat together. And now when you introduce the fantasy exercise, Sandy's genius is on full display because it tends to just crack people open in the most positive way, and it's real estate they never give back. Uh, this, this new level of freedom, this new level of not giving a fly and flip and rip what people think so we can get out of our head on a whole new level and just show up and be free. Thank you very much. Also, uh... Reminding me, there's a, there's a teacher in Paris that is an American teacher that claims to teach Meissner. And also he has testimonials from many Hollywood stars, but I've heard from many teachers and from what I've, I haven't studied with myself, but I know many people who have. And he seems like he doesn't really teach the Meissner technique. Uh, he's called Jack Walzer. So he teaches a dozen activities in a way, for example, he. He brings urgency at the door, which I've heard even from Plaus West people that we both know, 
uh, is contradictory to what my snow thought, meaning you there's no... Never have urgency. You should never have urgency at the door. You, need, you, can, you can have strong, compelling reasons, but if you had urgency at the door, you'd knock and say, do you have a fire extinguisher? they say no, and you'd leave. My house is on fire. My, my, my kid's pinned underneath a truck. I'm here. You'd leave. You, don't have, you never have urgency at the door. Ever, 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 ever. You have compelling. You have compelling. You're my best friend. I'm here to take you to rehab. I'm here to take you to rehab. I'm here to take you to your first chemo treatment because you can't drive and you're going to be sick and tired afterwards. So deep, compelling reasons for coming to the door, never urgency, ever, ever, ever. Yes, the urgency is for the activity and the door is something different, leaving the circumstances at the door being more, Absolutely. More free. Yep. yep. Um, yeah. and, and we could do like uh, two hours on the, the activity alone and asking you about uh, what you think it's for and the different function of the exercise. But uh, yes, many people, including this guy, teach the activity in a way that brings uh, systematic conflict because activity, there's an urgency, the door, there's an urgency, there's a conflict immediately and it creates like uh, conflictual high stakes exercises, which seem impressive, uh, but seem to be beside the point of the foundational work. Yeah, no, you know, look, initially when the door is first introduced, there's not a big high conflict. This needs to build. This needs to build brick by brick. You know, the people in the room, even when the door is first introduced, they don't have, they shouldn't, they shouldn't have urgency yet. The people in the room should not have urgency when the door is first introduced. It's, it, it's too much. It's too many balls in the air and all of a sudden people start playing a character. It's like a skit. It's like an improv, right? Yeah. Instead of some organic because we're so disciplined at working this way that we can now take this next brick and it doesn't sink us. But if you put too much on, it becomes a mess. Uh, you talked about uh, my snow being life-changing for you. What impact do you think uh, this technique can have on someone's life and psychology? Like, it seems to me like um, contradictorily to uh, the method acting, like Liz Strasberg kind of thing, which can be unhealthy. Uh, teaching, l learning the my snow technique can really uh, uh, open you up in some ways in your life. Sandy once said, you know, the beautiful thing about teaching actors is that you are the piano. You're the instrument. Your humanity, your sensitivity, who you are, your life experiences, of course. Is that all that you are? With an imag developed imagination, you can expand that to a whole new level. But again, you're more interesting as an actor, even if you've never even acted at age 25 than you were at 15. And you're gonna be more interesting at 35. You've laughed more, you've loved more, you've hurt more, you've broken hearts and had your hearts broken. Your well is deeper. The Meisner technique is all about accessing not only that well of your humanity, as Sandy would say, all the guys on your bench, all the shades and possibilities of who you are, the miser technique is all about authenticity. It impacts every relationship in your life because, well, because you are the instrument. And if this training is all about stepping into the most authentic, empowered, healthy version of you, how could it, and, and it is, by the way, how could it not impact every relationship in your life moving forward as you become more healthy, grounded, empowered, I'm, I, I got something to say, not ego, not ego, but I'm, 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 I'm enough, I'm enough, and I got something to say, and whether I impact one person, a thousand, a million, whatever, you know? and so it is a very profound, I mean, you know, go to our site, go to any legitimate teacher's site and read testimonials, and you're going to hear how impactful this is on them, how life-changing it is because for all the reasons I just said. Another dynamic that happens in the training, if you're in a relationship and the relationship is not healthy, it's gonna get exposed because you're gonna get healthier. It's, an, it, it's impossible, excuse me, it's impossible if you are being trained properly and doing the work that you are not going to be impacted in the most, po in the most em empowering positive ways, it's impossible. And so you're rising up, you're waking up, you're stepping into the, this version of you that demands to be seen and heard. And again, not in some ego way. And so in that process, like any relationship, we're gonna to grow together or apart, but this is like on steroids as you go through the training. People are getting transformed. And again, it's not like, you know, don't, you know, I don't, it's not some cult deal. It's not, you know, if you get a teacher, I hear people that have 
teach Meisner and they and, and the students are, you know, I've been, I've been there for seven, eight years. I'm like, oh my God, you know, we do it just like Sandy. You come here and as soon as it's done, you're gone. Your, our job is to get you out of here, not tie you to us. It doesn't mean you're going to grow into this training for the rest of your careers. It doesn't mean that there isn't value of having an, an after uh, a training experience. We have our, one of our studios we leave open for our graduates to continue to grow into, but they're not tethered to me and they're not paying for training. They're done with the training. Now grow into it. Go, go, go. But my point is, this, this is how impactful it is in every relationship because it impacts your most intimate relationships. You know, and if your relationship is healthy, uh, it's only going to get healthier because your partner's going, look at you fly. Look at you. Oh, my goodness. You're brighter than ever. You're sparklier than ever. You're you're healthier than ever. Damn. Now that'd have to be a very healthy dance partner. So it's I've been doing this a long time and I've watched what Sandy's genius does to people. And it's a very, very, very positive thing. How could it not be? Getting free of what people think about you, getting rid of all nerves and nervousness, being able to truly at your core believe that you deserve to have a voice on this planet, to, to act well, to be, if you're an actor and to be able to be so present and truthful, it's exhilarating. It's hard to shake off afterwards in a good way. You know, it's just exhilarating to work in such a spontaneous, instinctive way. And then, of course, the, the best part is, is just really falling into the most authentic version so that it, Sandy used to say, your talent's waiting for you right over there. Your talent's waiting for you right over there. It's called freedom. And that's what the miser technique's all about. And if that's the case, how does that not, in, not impact every relationship in your life? And it does. How do you think anyone can uh, uh, become an actor with learning the miser technique? I, get, I love this question. I get asked this all the time. I get asked, can you tr make any, turn anybody into an actor? I go, no, absolutely not. I can turn anyone in who cares. If you're willing to meet me halfway and, and together we put the foundation of Sandy's genius in place, I guarantee you when we're done, you will call yourself an actor and it will truly mean something. You'll be able to go work and dance and compete at the highest level in film, theater and television. There's no prediction. Some of the most talented actors on the history of acting didn't work much. People that have no business working are wildly successful. I'm not guaranteeing a career. I'm guaranteeing that you'll be able to call yourself an actor. You'll know how to work. You'll know how to fix it when it's not working and you won't need me. You'll know what you're doing. Guarantee you that. And I don't care what your natural talent is coming in that first day. And if you really work hard, by the way, you'll keep uncovering and growing into your talent. So many people in an acting class, they'll look around and it, they'll define them like they did in high school. They look around at all the cool kids and go, I suck. I'm doomed to just have a life of suck. No, you're not. This ain't it. And same thing in an acting class. Some people do have more natural ability out of the gate, a lot more freedom for a myriad of reasons. That's why I say don't compare your instrument to anybody else in the room. And understand, are you in or not? I'm a much better actor than I was 30 years ago. I'm a better actor than I was a year ago. So if I'm going to be defined by where I was 30 years ago, I should have quit. I am positive I can turn, through Sandy's genius, I can help anyone who wants to be an actor, not only be, become one in terms of craft, but be able to literally say it with, with, with conviction and, 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 and authenticity and truth. I know what I'm doing. I can, I can go play. I know how to work. How should anyone uh, go about uh, uh, meeting you to, to learn if they want to like, uh, join you in September, sure. for example? It's called the Miser Technique Studio.com. Uh, just Google Jim Jarrett or the studio. We offer a lot of online teachings. I developed a series a bunch of years ago called Meisner Trained. I didn't call it the Meisner Technique. I called it Meisner Trained. And I was just trying to show some teachings from the work in here some exchanges, some of the brilliance that happens because of Sandy. We have a lot of YouTube videos, YouTube channel of that. All that stuff's free. Um, and then they can just reach out. Uh, we have students fly from all over the world uh, to, to move to, here to study with us. We only take 20 students at a time. There's a wait list to study with us as well. I say that with all the appreciation and gratitude in the world. So if you ever were interested, the sooner you can reach out, the better for the next session. Like I say, we're completely full, all classes at all levels. We can't start another one until September. 
um, and we're already interviewing for that and have already, it's, I don't think it's half full, but we've got a, a good solid list so far. And so anyway, that's how they can get a hold of us. Nice. And also you talked about uh, online products. Uh, you have like uh, career coaching or things that people can join right now from a distance or? Yeah, we've got some very exciting things happening. Um, and it's not because, we're, you know, we're going about to reopen and we're going to reopen our school in, shortly. Um, it's not because we can't teach. And it, again, it's not because we're going for a money grab. We've just been during this time off have been sitting around just playing with a lot of ideas. And because of the way things have shifted and changed, we're like going, wow. Um, there's some things that we can be doing that could be of service. So one of the things, I'll just say it, uh, what the hell, one of the things that may even be up by the time you view this is we are going to turn this studio into what, what I would call a hot set. In other words, we're going to stream classes and allow people to audit classes from around the world for a, a fee, obviously. Uh, we, of course, we'll get all the students' approval who uh, to be a part of this because we don't, we What's first and foremost important are the students' uh, safety, uh, their confidence, their security. And if anyone's not wanting that, we just won't record during that. But there's, anyway, that's one thing that we are going to offer. We're also going to be offering the chance to teach me, teach you from wherever, your, let's say, your studio to be uh, a fly on the wall and watching work and, and help teach the work. But you'd have to have a proper studio. You'd have to have proper cameras and lighting and everything. You just can't have two people in a room and some iPhone, you know. You need to be able to do it well, to do it well. Um, so that I've already been doing that and I'm available for that. I'm available for one-on-one -on -one private coaching with teachers, with actors from around the world as well. All that's on our website. Anything I can answer for you. I always offer the first session free of charge just to figure out what it is that you want, what you're looking for and whether I can help you or not. And then from there, we structure what would be a realistic amount of time. If you want more after that, you can sign up. But typically it doesn't take a whole heck of a lot to get you moving where you want to go. I do have a newsletter I've been sending out for seven years. Every Sunday I send a newsletter out. It's not about the Meisner technique. It's about trying to help anyone out there uh, be healthy about their dream. Earlier we talked about turning someone into an actor. The problem is there's nothing more common than really talented, well-trained actors who are out of work. If you can't handle the business part of it, the marketing, the promotion, and as importantly, the mental health part, the emotional mental health part of being of having such a big, enormous dream and such a overwhelming, it's been called the most competitive profession on the planet for a reason. So if you're trying to sail across this ocean called almost impossible, your boat better be rock solid. And your boat is your craft. Your boat is your mental, emotional, physical, spiritual health too, because you're the instrument. You're the president of your dream. You're director of marketing, national sales manager. You're the talent. You're the therapist. You better be. And if you're not, you're gonna your boat's going to start leaking. So many actors quit, not because they're sick of acting, they're just sick of the struggle. It was one of the things I take students to Hawaii on retreat. We just finished a couple online versions. This can be taught online. We've just done it back-to-back -back weeks with our students, where instead of taking them to Hawaii, I just present the teachings here via Zoom. And that has turned out to be enormously successful. And that is all, has nothing to do with the technique. And it has all the things to do with what I've learned in 34 years of going after this crazy dream and being able to hang in there and have the resiliency to take a punch and come back better for it. So it is a very, uh, I call it empowered dreaming. What I've learned along the way, the good, the bad, and the ugly, and the goal is to save you a ton of time, energy, and money. Uh, but like Kyla said, there's just all of this stuff is either on the site or will be coming. The Meisner Technique Studio.com and we'll try to do a better job in all ways of announcing it via social media, so you might hear about it that way too. And a newsletter, I'm sorry, every Sunday. You can sign up, it's free. I've charged nothing, don't want any. It's just trying to, here's what I did this week, here's what I learned, or I just talk about something that's happened, and I just do my very best to try to be as honest as possible about the things that scare me, my struggles, what I've learned, um, pull from stories, an article, a film, anything. I, some days, I'm literally, <laughs> it goes out Sunday and Saturday night, I'm like going, uh, <laughs> I'm not sure. And then other weeks I've got content backed up like crazy because I've just got a, a flow going, but it's all designed to try to help uh, in some way, help you going after your dream in a, in a much healthier, less anxiety, stress-filled way. Thank you very much, Jim, uh, for all this. Uh, I think unless you have other things to share, we, we could go no, on. This will be a good end for now. You know, I want to just stress once again, this is the honest truth. You know, we, we really just really officially met recently, like really spoke, not met, um, but spoke 
And it's because of that exchange, I'm just speaking for myself, that I was um, excited to move forward in any way with you. I could tell um, truly how sincere you are and how humble you are and how desirous you are to be better at all of this. And I just, you know, I just want to say that. I want to say it's a pleasure meeting you. I've heard about you for years. Paris Meisner, you guys, I know you've, uh, over the years, a lot of people that I know you've brought into the world and your world and these wonderful people. And so I've always, just always heard about you as well, but I, I just, I've heard such positive things and now I know firsthand and I'm not being gratuitous. I really mean it. And I, in a world where we're trying to uphold Sandy's legacy and integrity and standards and the purity of it, um, I'm grateful for you for this opportunity to be able to uh, find somebody that cares as much as I do and, and share these things. I know this is going to piss off some people. There are going to be some people coming, you know, I'm sure of that. I tried to be as honest and diplomatic as possible, as respectful as possible. Um, but I, I know that I was perfectly honest as well. So there's that too. Uh, it was okay. great to interview you and, and I would have many more questions. We can do a little series if you want on different exercises and themes and stuff with pleasure. Whatever you want to do, I'm in, okay? Whatever, in whatever capacity moving forward, I'd, I'd be I'd thrilled to. And I look forward to the day of being in that studio, that beautiful space of yours, and doing my Meisner play. With great pleasure. Cool. My love and best, and thank you all for watching. Thank you very much. So there's a website, a YouTube channel, maybe on Instagram and Facebook as well. Yes. I don't know. I, my daughter's here. I keep, you keep looking one way. I'm looking this way. This is my daughter. The Miser Technique Studio everywhere, she says. I guess that must mean Instagram, uh, Facebook as well. If you search that name, you'll find it.